and to, our reading starts at G- Genesis 37 verses 2 to 4. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bela and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. And we continue on in in chapter 41, verses 1 to 8. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile, when out of the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the river bank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven ears of corn, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other ears of corn, sprouted thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin ears of corn swallowed up the seven healthy ears, healthy full ears. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dream, but no one could interpret them for him. And then we continue in that same chapter, verses 14 to 16. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. And then we turn to chapter 45, verses 1 to 5. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, Make everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him, because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Then our last reading is from chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now, please forgive the sins of the of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to Joseph, to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for the good to accomplish what is now being done 
the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And then he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. There ends our reading. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, I want to start by, by reading a quotation from the late Ray Steadman. He's an evangelical expository preacher. He said this, If you want, to ex- uh, want a wonderful experience, take your New Testament and use a concordance to look up the two little words, but God. See how many times human resources have been brought to an utter end. How despair has gripped the heart and pessimism and gloom has settled upon people. And there is nothing that can be done. Then see how the Spirit of God writes in luminous letters, but God. And the whole situation changes into victory. And that's exactly what we've been seeing here in these but God instances as we've looked for. And it's, it's so true for this next recipient of, the, of, a, of a but God time. And that's Joseph. Joseph had many, you know, of all the, the Old Testament stories, I think Joseph is probably the most amazing because he tops it all. His life went like this, this roller coaster. One minute he's, he's, you know, he's his dad's favorite, next minute he's in a pit. And then he's exalted in the, in the house of Potiphar, and the, then he's in jail. It's up and down, this roller coaster ride. You know, it says rinse and repeat the whole time. Rinse and repeat. He jump, 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 jump. But despite the hatred, despite the, the rejection, despite the, the mistreatment and the false imprisonment, the presence of God transformed Joseph into a man that blessed so many people. A man that's, that we still talk about today. And who musicals are made of. You know, I close my eyes, hold back the curtain, or whatever. <laughs> but God... The, the but God in Joseph's life made a difference to him. That but God, but God moment. And so today we're going to look at three but God moments and their importance in Joseph's life. And it's the, the but God overriding principle that changes lives. The but God attitude we need to have towards the Lord in this life. And then the but God attitude we need towards others, even if they've hurt us, even if they've wronged us. So this first but God moment, this overriding principle that changes lives. Acts chapter 7 verse 9 and 10 reads this. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him, the patriarchs meaning his brothers, because they became all the the tribes of Israel. They sold him as a slave into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. So there's Joseph. He went through so many things, but God was with him. God rescued him from all his troubles. And what are some of the troubles that Joseph had? What are the things that he experienced? What what were some of the things he experienced that could have derailed his life? What could have messed up his life and left him being damaged and twisted? The rejection that he experienced was huge. Now, how many of you have older siblings? I don't. How many of you? Do you who has an older who has older siblings? Siblings? Yeah, older siblings. No, couple. Yeah, all right. You've got older siblings. Can you imagine having ten older brothers? Okay, Tanya, you're nodding like you. Do. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Imagine having ten older brothers. Can you imagine looking up at up at them and and trying as the younger to please them? It's bad enough trying to please one or two, but uh, ten, trying to please ten of them. But what did he get in return for trying to, to please his brothers? He was hated. He was rejected. He was stripped from the support of his parents, being cast away from his, and by, his, by his own brothers and thrown in a pit and left to die. Poor Joseph. 
He was just trying to be good. And as we saw in Genesis 37 verse 4, and when his brothers saw that his father loved him more than any of them, because they had given them the, given Joseph this ornate cloak, a sign of authority, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. They didn't just hate him, but everything they said to him was, mm, 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 you know, this, this vile, oh, evil stuff that was just being thrown at him the whole time. But jealousy is a terrible thing, isn't it? Yeah. Jealousy is a terrible thing. And that's what led to Joseph's brothers not being able to say one nice thing to him. He was dad's favorite, and they hated him for that. They were so jealous. And as a modern day example, well, we have a lot of hatred and hostility on social media. Eh? It comes from envy. It comes from jealousy. Many feel that, feel the need to try and exalt themselves by pulling others down. And social media is an easy way to do it. You just hide behind your phone and you spit those words out. See, but social media was created to bring people together. But studies have shown that social media has become a toxic place. Instead of bringing people together, it's brought anger, it's brought hatred, it's brought deception amongst people. People have become more and more obsessed with themselves and then that intensifies the jealousy and the hatred for others when, when your life doesn't seem to measure up to the, the glamorous online mirage that other people put forward. And unfortunately, that even extends into the Christian circles, even into the church. And it was the same jealousy-fueled hatred that was in Joseph's day as well, with him. Joseph's own brothers hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. And ultimately, it leads to rejection. And how many people today are, are damaged today because of the rejection and the hatred that they've experienced from others? How many are trying to cope with those situations without a but God moment in their life. But what about rejection? Well, the wonderful, well, the incredible thing about God becoming man, healing the sick, enabling the lame to walk, and even raising the dead, was that he was also rejected. Well, so never forget that Jesus knows all about having but all about rejection, because he experienced it himself, at its worst. John chapter 1 verse 11, Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. 1 Peter 2 verse 4, as you come to him, that's the Lord Jesus, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. Isaiah 53 verse 3, the Lord Jesus was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hid, the, men hid their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. John chapter 7 verse 5 tells us that even Jesus' own brothers didn't believe him. They rejected him. And then extending a bit wider in Luke chapter 4, we read that even Jesus' hometown didn't accept him. And then you just have to read the Gospels and you see that the nation of Israel didn't even accept him. How's that for rejection? So what's the answer? What's the answer to rejection? Well, the only answer that I know is the one that got Joseph through all those years. His brother has hated him so much and they sold him into slavery. But God was with him. But God was with him. The only solution that I know is to, that we need to find our identity and our acceptance in Christ and to know that he will never leave us or forsake us. He will never reject us. He will never turn his back on us. But God was with Joseph and that made all the difference in all his trials and his difficulties. There's only the presence and the work of God that can take the terrible things that happen to us 
and use them for our good. No one else can do that. No therapist can do that. No psychologist, no psychiatrist. Only God can. God, God can use those, those situations we find ourselves in and use them for our good. Without God, the hatred and the rejection leads to bitterness and anger in response. See, only God can bring peace. Only God can bring peace to a troubled heart and actually use those difficult experiences for his good. The second but God comes when Joseph was unjustly kept in prison. We know the story. There's Joseph working in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife sees that he's a dashing young man. She tries to seduce him. Joseph has nothing of it. And what does he do? He runs out. Potiphar's wife, on the other hand, goes to her father, uh, goes to her husband and says, uh, you know, Potiphar, this servant of yours, he tried to seduce me. He tried to get me into bed. And look, he ran away. I've still got his robe here. And of course, like a loyal husband, yes, I believe you, wife, throw Joseph in jail. There he is, poor Joseph. Once again, this person has done nothing wrong. Landing up, now he's in prison. And there where he's in prison, there's the cupbearer and the bread maker. They have these dreams. Joseph interprets these dreams. And unfortunately, the baker loses his life, but the cupbearer is restored. And as he's leaving prison, Joseph says to the cupbearer, remember me, remember me before Pharaoh so that I can get out of here. And Joseph's sitting there in prison waiting for the cupbearer, to, for, waiting for the word to come back that he can now be free. And he waits and he waits and he waits. It's pretty easy to get bitter when you're waiting like that. Waiting. You've asked somebody to, to do something. Remember me in this. Remember me. We get bitter. We get twisted on far, far less nowadays. But what did Joseph say to Pharaoh when he eventually came out? You see, Joseph's words stand as a, a greater principle than just the example here. See, Pharaoh had these dreams that nobody could interpret, not even his wise men. And then the, the, the cupbearer remembers, yes, I had a dream when I was in prison. And Joseph, this, there was this man, Joseph, he interpreted my dream and it came true. Call for him. So Joseph comes out, has, a, you know, has the shave and clean clothes and he's there before Pharaoh. Then in there in Genesis 41 verse 16, Joseph says to Pharaoh, after Pharaoh has told him his dreams, he says, I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. I can't say for sure, as Joseph replies to Pharaoh, but I'm sure there was, a, there was this huge pause in between where he said, I cannot do it, but God will. I can imagine Pharaoh, with, in that pause period, the cupbearer said that he could, but now he's saying he can't. He's saying himself he can't. What am I going to do with this guy? But then Joseph says, but God will. God will. See, Joseph had never deserted his faith in God. He could have gone to Pharaoh and said, well, no, sorry, I can't. And just left it at that. But he said, I can't do it, but God will. See, God had never turned on his faithfulness to Joseph either. In all those years, despite the tremendous lows that Joseph had experienced, despite the years rolling by without any resolution to his problems, sitting there in jail the whole time, Joseph's faith remains the same. And you'd think with all that time imprisoned, you know, how many things in his life could he have thought about? Things that had happened to him. And then he slowly learns to say, I cannot do it, but God can and will. And those feelings of resentment towards his brothers. I can't do it, but God can and will. God will be able to heal the situation. And his feelings towards in, of revenge as he's sitting there in prison. Revenge against Potiphar's wife. Revenge against the cupbearer. The fleshly thoughts getting to him. We need to remember that there was a lot going on for Joseph. 
during his time in prison. A lot of things going on for him. Psalm 150, verse 17 to 19 reads this. He sent a man before him, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons till the word of the Lord proved him true. That's the psalmist. So what are we struggling with at the moment? What are we struggling to handle at the moment? Is there anything that's getting us twisted? Is there anything else that's getting that's making us feel revengeful? There's lots of pressure on us today. But learning to say, I cannot do it, but God can and will is the key lesson. I can't do it, but God can and will. And in the language of the New Testament, this I can't do it, but God will is expressed in the thought, not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, he's speaking of the Lord. He says, the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I, Paul, will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest in me. In Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I can't do it, but God can and will. And as Paul says in, later in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, after talking about all the things that he's been through, he says, I can do everything. I can be content in every single situation. Because it's through him who gives me strength. I can't do things of my own strength, but God can. So what's important is the, the who who has the final word. Is it you or is it God? Do you say, well, I can't do it because uh, I don't want to. Or maybe I can't do it because I'm too fearful. Or I can't do it because they hurt me. I'm not going to let it go. Or do you bring God into the situation, whatever it may be, whatever that situation may be, and, and let him have the final place in that sentence. I can't do it, but God will enable me and give me what I need. Joseph, let God have the final word. In whatever hurt or challenge that we face, we need to end our thoughts with, but God, but God. How do you end your sentence? With God's ability? Or your inability with with God's place in your life or your own will. The third but God in the life of Joseph is an awesome one, for it tells us how we we see all the all the difficulties and how we are to relate to others, even to those around who hurt us. In that passage from Genesis fifty, We've got this where Joseph's brothers have died. Oh, Joseph's father has died and his brothers are now at, a, at wit's end because, you know, what's going to happen? Now that our father's not here, what's Joseph going to do? So they send a message to him of saying, you know, please be easy with us. And when Joseph gets the message, he weeps. He weeps. And then the brothers come before Joseph and they fall down on their knees before him. And Joseph says to him, what you intended, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Isn't that a wonderful but God passage? So here it's Jacob, their fathers died, Joseph's brothers are, are scared. Can you imagine the, the brothers' thoughts? Well, is Joseph going to pay us back now? Now that our father's not around to keep the peace, is he going to pay us back for the way we've mistreated him? The way we sold him as a slave? Is he going to sell us as a slave now? Is he going to throw us into prison? He's got the total power to do it. What's he going to do? So they come to Joseph expressing their fears. And Joseph weeps. He weeps. He's not trying to re repay their evil with evil. 
but he's repaying their evil with good. And how is he able to do it? By not, not imagining that it never happened. Because he says, you intended to harm me. Their intention is not overlooked, but it's swallowed up by the realization of the greater purpose of God in all of this. It's dwarfed by the but God in that, poll, in that whole passage. But God intended it for good. And this is, but God releases that grudge that we have as fallen human beings that we hold on to so dearly. But God, I can't release it, but God can and will. There's something in the book of Hebrews that we're told to be very careful about, and, and that's not allowing the root of bitterness to, to, to grow within our lives. And this passage comes directly after them speaking about the discipline of God. It's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 through to 15. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level the paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live at peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misuses the grace of God and that, or so no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. What happens to roots? Roots grow. They strengthen. They go down deep. They, they feed the plant. So be careful not to let your bitterness, your bitter roots grow. Don't feed your bitterness. Culture at large today is a culture of offense. You know, it's that culture of, of victimhood. You, people get offended over anything and everything. You just have to put a full stop in the wrong place and people will get upset now. So many people are bitter, continually Focusing on that bitterness and feeding that bitterness. So it just that root just grows and grows and grows. But scripture tells us that a root of bitterness causes trouble. And through it, many are defiled. It spreads through us. If we let it take root. As we feed it, it spreads right through us. But unfortunately... Bitter people sometimes are not content to keep that bitterness to themselves, but they, they want to spread it through to others as well. Happens in culture today, so often. It even happens in the church life. Instead, we need to look at what Hebrews 12 tells us. What, Hebrews says, what it says there, that we mustn't allow that lame limb of ours to go unhealed. We've got to realize that discipline and difficulties are ultimately from God. And they are for our good. Take note if you're becoming lame in a particular area. It might be a relationship, a, a hurtful experience, or it might be a fear that you have. Take note of what is causing your walk to stumble and not allowing you to move on with Christ. As Romans 12 verse 18 and 21 says, There's, as much as it is up to you, pursue peace with all men. As much as it's up to you. It will be bad experiences. Many of them outside of your own control. But don't be the cause of them. Like Joseph, repay evil with good. And don't come short on the grace of God. In other words, realize that there is grace for you. There is grace for you. There's grace for me. There's grace for everyone. And it's that grace of God that upholds us. And realize that but God and His grace can and should have the last word. And go to Him in complete honesty. Go to God in complete honesty and openness and receive that grace in the time of need you that time where you're finding it difficult, that time when things are happening, that wrong things are happening, people are against you. Go to God, complete honesty and openness. 
if you can see that God is even in the difficulties that you face, it changes everything. Because you know you're not on your own. If you can see that he always has purposes to bring good out of every situation, that's the game changer. God's plan is often very well. Joseph's life, as we've seen, it was a roller coaster filled with, the, with many difficult trials. But God was with him. But God was with him and had a fantastic plan for Joseph. So much so that he saved a whole nation. If it hadn't been for that roller coaster ride, who knows what would have happened, where Joseph would have landed up. It's always good to remember the purpose and the plan of God. The speakers, Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost when he stood up and, and spoke to the crowds with, that were there. And he spoke concerning Jesus' life. He, more than any, Jesus was rejected. He was hurt. He was pierced. He was killed. But God caused it for the good of you and me. But God meant it for the saving of lives. And that's what he's done. That's Acts chapter 2, verse 22 to 24. Peter's words. He says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. See, but God is the overriding principle that changes our lives. I can't. But God. And it's the, the attitude that we need towards the Lord in this life. I can't, Lord, but you. It's the attitude we need towards Him. It's the attitude we need towards others. I can't, but God can. And even to those who have hurt us, I can't do it. But God, you can, through your grace, you can work in my life and bring forgiveness. I can't do it. But God will enable me and will give me what I need. Amen. Heavenly Father, if it's not, if it isn't for that, but God, we flounder on our own. We try as hard as we want to, but we never get it right. We see from Joseph's life, but God, but God. So often, he could have been so bitter towards his brothers for the way that he was mistreated by them. He could have been bitter towards Potiphar's house for the way that he was treated there. He could have been bitter towards the way that the cupbearer treated him. But God. Father, help us. Help us in every avenue in our lives to remember but God. I can't, but God can. I can't, but God can. Amen. Oh,